So a couple of weeks ago, I actually got to go to all the way down to Santa Fe to the Southwest Indian market. It's an annual thing. It actually reached its 100th year this year. And at the market, there was a specific event put on by an organization called the Lumen Native. And if you don't know anything about Lumen Native, they're a native and woman leg organization that kind of focuses on empowering native voices to shift the narrative of how we are represented in pretty much every aspect. This event they had on, there was very, there were a couple of different panels. And one of them that I got a chance to kind of uh, record and get some insight on was from uh, showrunners and writers of Rutherford Falls and Reservation Dogs. So in this panel, we had uh, Ciara Teller Ornelas, Jenna Schmidting, Bobby Wilson, and Tommy Pico. And they all had some very interesting insights uh, on their experiences and their opinions on the shows that they've worked on and the future of Indigenous representation. When I first started developing Rutherford Falls with Mike Sherna Helms, we talked about just like the first story of this country, like as America. And it was like, well, it's an indigenous story that has to be indigenous people. And then we were, I was very much, you know, I wrote that line of like, the history of indigenous people is the greatest story never told. And that being juxtaposed with, you know, the story you hear all the time. And I do think that people, you know, television audiences are so savvy. They, they like so much stuff on the internet about television. <laughs> Some might say too much. And so to have a new story, to have a story, like I remember being in writer's rooms in Rutherford where you had like 30 rock writers and people had written on like big shows. And you know, someone would talk about like, you know, land management or Bobby would have so many stories <laughs> touring the country. And they'd be like, I've never heard the story before. And the, the power of an original story, I think will always have value. And they were so excited to find like a new type of comedy and a new kind of thing. That at least in the room, it wasn't hard to convince them to do anything because we were in charge, but also just like we had good stories. And I think that usually in a room, like the best story wins. I'm wondering, you know, I myself have had some pretty surprising statements, you know, made about like, oh, I'm surprised we would exist, you know. Um, have What are some of the statements or some of the perceptions that you've come across or anything that's surprising that somebody has said to you that has come out of that invisibility? I'm not very surprised by the things that white people say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more focused on this, the really nice things that Indians have said. <laughs> <laughs> That, that was unexpected. Yeah, yeah, that was unexpected. That's always a surprise. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, they like it. <laughs> well, I remember on Rutherford Falls, um, I think it was from this probably also wrote on season one, we had Illuminates come, we had a lot of like um, like a tribal lawyer, like all different types of people come and just like, do talks and stuff. And Mike Schur, who co-created the show, did like The Good Place and Parks and Rec, he asked every like native um, consultants like do you have an example of like a positive native representation in the media because he was like it'd just be nice to know if there's something and everyone's like no like it was like everybody did that and it was the craziest thing and so it felt really good to know that like like seeing people dress up you know, like Red Dogs and Rutherford Falls on Halloween and stuff. It was just really cool to see like, oh, we actually created positive native representation. <laughs> like you didn't think, you didn't think about it. You didn't think about what you didn't have until you had it. It was a very weird feeling. And I also, once we saw the kids dress up as characters that we created, like on Halloween, and like the thing is like, I was a little bit nervous about it's like um, reception and all that kind of stuff. But after I saw those kids on Halloween, you couldn't tell me shit. You couldn't tell me anything. I was like, this is honestly like, we just want to make sure that the kids don't want to die. Like, come on now. Like, and they wanted to be characters that we created, that we wrote. That was amazing. No, I feel the same way. Like you would see people like, um, there was this like little kid on Twitter who was dancing like Michael during the um, Dirty Dancing sequence in season two. And they were just like twirling. And I was like, Bawling. <laughs> and then I remember there were so many little girls being like, Jana looks like me. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. And so, yeah, it's a really, really, it's like a weird feeling, but it's such a good feeling. I mean, the success of it alone is like, now you have people who are like, oh, well, people are interested in Indians and not like from the past, like, you know, like now we can actually have people pitching like, I don't know, rom-coms and shit like that, you know, like, and actually get their, their stories that they've been wanting to tell uh, out there and to uh, receptive studios that will actually listen to the pitch, you know? And the, the fact that it could be written by people like us, right? And starring people like us. 
I don't know if you've ever watched Star Trek The Next Generation, but there's an episode in the last season called Journey's End, where uh, the Enterprise has to like uh, displace these native people who've been searching for 200 years to find a home planet. And it was like, why does natives in the future look exactly like natives in the past? <laughs> It was like, could we get like, my, my goal is to, to pitch that planet as a show on Paramount and ha hire native people so we can see natives in space. I wanted to see their technology. I wanted to see their phasers. I wanted to see their starships. We didn't get any of that. It, like the uh, getting the opportunity, I just want to see natives in space. Like, because I remember even though that episode is problematic, I watched it when I was in fourth grade and I said, natives are in the future. You know, like that was really powerful. And I really love what Tommy kind of picked up on here when talking about Star Trek and then him talking about, you know, bending and, and synthesizing and everything. And that goes into more of what I want to talk about later about like, you know, indigenizing and synthesizing genres that make it more accessible and also more exciting. But I really loved how he touched on the Star Trek episode. And because that was something that very interested me, it reminded me also of a old Clone Wars episode about a race that is very obviously inspired by, you know, natives. Just going further into the idea of indigenous futurism, I just thought it was really cool that he mentioned that. And, you know, this is a glimpse into like how native creators are thinking about this as well. I'll also say that um, something that we really cared a lot about on Rutherford was making sure that we were um, buying from uh, native designers, like for our clothing and for the costumes. And um, yeah, there's a lot of people who have been on the show, you know, their work has been on the show in this room and, um, and in, at the market this weekend. And um, that has been very rewarding to be able to showcase everyone's talent um, from, you know, quilting to clothing to jewelry, you know, and, and there's, and sky's the limit, you know, like the more seasons we get of this kind of content, the more we all benefit um, as artists. And, you know, non-natives seeing that is really wonderful too, because we are all small business owners and this is helpful um, to be able to sell. And so many people have come up to me and been like, in this episode, who was this, you know, earring maker and, um, you know, who did this t-shirt or whatever. And to be able to tag these people and, and you know, guide people toward, um, you know, episode f uh, four of this season, right, Adirondack was four. We had Natalie Ball, who has artwork in here, you know, and she was like a, a we hired Natalie Ball as Natalie Ball to play Natalie Ball. <laughs> So now people who watch the show know who Natalie Ball is. Like, and that's, I think, really important to us and our ethos, uh, not only as um, you know, creatives, but also as Native people, that we are making sure to take care of our community as artists. Um, and you know, hopefully we get more seasons, because there's so many people that we still want to highlight. <laughs> no, there's always more to be done. There's always more to do. I think, like, you know, the real test will be when we have a show that, that fails, you know, and, and they'll let us make another one after that. And what I thought was interesting here when Sierra says that, you know, the true test is when a show gets canceled. And unfortunately, um, now, in retrospect, because <laughs> this was filmed just, you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, but Rutherford Falls was indeed canceled from Peacock. And it's kind of, it's it's unfortunate, yes. And, but I do agree with her as a, like, you know, it encourages native creators to try even harder, to push even harder, to make something that will continue to go on. And I'm, this isn't to downplay Rutherford Falls. I actually really love Rutherford Falls. I, I'm really sad that it's getting canceled. And I, you know, obviously I don't understand the internal politics of NBC, of why it's being canceled and everything. But I also think it's, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the positive of this. So kind of like what Sierra mentioned is that it gives more opportunity. There's going to be more things to be able to pitch out there. A wave of movies about baseball or a wave of what? And then there's one stinker and then they're like, no more of that. You know, we've talked, you had that conversation with Ava DuVernay. Do you want to talk about that? About like Renaissance and... Oh yeah, I had a really interesting conversation with Ava DuVernay. No big deal. It's <laughs> fine. Googler. Ava DuVernay. Um, I got to interview her um, as part of sort of like our, our PR stuff for season one. And I asked her the question, you know, what is something that, what is a term or a colloquialism that is used in our industry that you want to reject? And, uh, you know, she makes, um, 
you know, film and TV uh, for the black audience primarily. And she said, I really want to reject the idea of a renaissance. It, it implies that we're here momentarily. It implies that we're going to have this boom, but then there, the, then we'll have the dark ages. <laughs> and I really internalize that. And I want us to stop using that term too, because um, I do think that in order to continue and make sure that we are we stay here um, we just have to dig our heels in and, and not um, stop pushing in the, in the way that our leaders have um, and the people who've come before us like there's a lot of unsung uh, work in this industry that has happened that has paved the way there would be no me without a tattoo there would be um, no me without a Zahn McLaren who's here. There's, there's like no, there's. We have to make sure that we are addressing the people who have come before us and making space for the younger generations to succeed in the same way that we have been provided the opportunity. Yeah. And I think that's a boon to us as creators and and um, as artists and stuff because. I started to see something, what they were calling a, the new native renaissance of literature, like kind of when I was coming up, it was like me and uh, Therese and Tommy Orange and all these people who were coming out with stuff, and they were like, oh, new native renaissance. And I was like, we're not new. Like, we're, we've been here for a while. I mean, maybe it's the first time y'all are reading us, but we've been reading each other for good or bad. Um, and, <laughs> and But what I saw in that generation and among my peers was a lot of, big up of each other's work and keeping the door open for other people and keeping that spirit of generosity and making sure that there are as many native voices as there are native voices you know and like that is really important uh, or something that you want to see on screen i want like a gay native villain you know what i mean like i'm done with heroes i'm so done with heroes i'm done with heroes i, just, I want villains you know or like or like i don't know just like really like profane foul mouth thoughty, um, <laughs> despicable, hilarious <laughs> characters. You know, that's what I want. I want some profanity in there. Bobby, do you have any big dreams that you want to share? Uh, just to be able to afford a house like this. <laughs> Not the tent. <laughs> well, you can, if the tent comes in, uh, that's cool. Oh, the tent. Yeah. How much it's like a tent? super big tent. <laughs> You guys can all come visit. Um, I mean, I love like classic TV, so I want like a native multicam, like something on network TV. I think you know it's a beautiful thing that we're all on streaming platforms, but I also think like a lot of native communities don't have good internet, and so their access to some of these programs I think is still you know an issue. So I mean, I would love just more, more of everything. Um, I would also love to see like a historical drama through our lens. I think we're exhausted by the bad version of it, but I think seeing it with us at the helm would be really cool. I also want to see historical drama. Um, I'm really excited for the projects that are happening. There's a lot of um, projects that uh, we haven't heard about yet because they haven't been announced, but there are movies and, and uh, shows that are being pitched as we speak, and there's. I think we're just sort of, this is just the first wave of many and um, I, I of course am very uh, I love women and I love women in comedy and so I um, always want to see more women native women on screen and um, native women laughing um, that's my dream and vision um, but I want to see it all I'm, I'm so excited about every project it's just awesome I'm hyped to see all these young actors that we've got, like, yeah. and all the next shit that they're gonna do. And it was like a crazy moment on the set of Reservation Dogs when Lane Factory plays Cheese. Uh, he was saying like, oh yeah, man, I wanna be like Batman someday. <laughs> and I looked at his ass and I was like, god damn, he could actually do that. <laughs> He's like in a Spielberg movie next. It's like, god damn, like, you know, that's like, that's cool as hell to actually look at him, to hear him say that and to be like, to actually, truly believe like, oh yeah, like he could actually do some shit like that. It's a product of infrastructure, like yeah. it's fucking cool. And even running into, uh, uh, I always fuck up her name because I'm not from up there, but Gewindio. Gewindio. Yeah. Like, she was on Rutherford, she's like a lead in the fucking uh, Airbender series, and it's just like to see them go, like, uh, just keep going, keep going, keep going, and like, uh, I, I'm so excited to see what these 
little shits come up with. <laughs> well, didn't have her opportunity. I mean, like, it was such an honor to cast Geraldine Keems to see her on Reservation Dogs. Oh, and, like, yeah. that's someone who, like, I grew up just adoring. And, you know, Kimberly Guerrero, like, she mentioned on set, she plays Renee uh, Terry Thomas's wife on our show. And she was like, you know, I did Seinfeld and I killed, and then I never did comedy again until today. And I was like, holy shit. And, and so just to also, like, just pulling everyone up and seeing everyone's range has just been such a gift. Yeah, I want to do a road trip comedy with Gary Farmer. Oh, Me and Gary. Should I just write that right now? Please I do. just came up with it. Should we, <laughs> should we go back here? Oh, just, it. The four of us can break it. <laughs> Anybody needs a writer's assistant job. <laughs> So the whole thing I just thought was really interesting. I also got to see uh, Zana McLaren over there and everything. And um, hopefully I can talk to him more about Dark Winds. And unfortunately, just because of poor planning on my part <laughs> and uh, just how far away the market is compared to where I live, uh, I was only able to spend a li limited amount of time at the market. But I did get to uh, attend a fashion show and the art that was at that fashion show, uh, the show was called Sovereign. And it was really cool to see, again, kind of going back to what Tommy was talking about with this idea of indigenous futurism combining indigenous themes and pop culture together in a lot of art. Here we have a painting by a Navajo artist based in New Mexico named Ryan Singer. His art is completely full of this idea. He combines Navajo life and culture with Star Wars and other themes. I really love the BB-8 pottery and obviously, you know, the, the First Order Stormtrooper, Pueblo size, you know, all this, all this type of art here that we're seeing, all of this, it's just, it's a really cool, especially here with Geronimo and Sitting Bull as, you know, kind of like modern biker dudes or punks, you know, <laughs> and it, all of this is just a really exciting, you know, representation of like, not only of how we see ourselves, but how we are continuing to both adapt, but also maintain our cultural identity in a post-colonial society. And this is kind of going back to you know, the, 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 the filmmaking and the art both. And I feel like art and literature are already ahead of filmmaking and TV shows and other forms of media where we're getting this type of content. A lot of this art that, that, is show, that I'm showcasing here is something that is so far ahead of what I think will be consumed in the popular media and film. A lot of these artists, they're small artists. I, I feel like a lot of them are only uh, really seen on Instagram and maybe a, a couple of other websites. And obviously this show is giving a chance to show them. But I just think it's a, such, a, such a cool thing to see uh, how this is coming forward and this is something i'd love to see more of in popular media just like tommy was mentioning and again like you saw in the panel they were kind of playing around with messing with genres and indigenizing genres or indigenizing certain things and, and it goes back to what i was saying in my prey video this is the future in my opinion of how natives can be a, a greater part of our own narrative and a greater part of the human narrative you know obviously considering the history of our peoples i feel like it's an important step of having our voices heard we've seen this greatly with uh, large scale films like black panther for the black community and even more so with a sequel where we're getting namor who is obviously based off of uh, either aztec and or a mayan peoples and we're gonna get a you know a, a more indigenous uh, representation of a villain, and I, I hope that they do some justice to him and, and everything because his character is actually a very interesting and deep character. But again, this is just an example. One thing that comes to mind uh, actually is uh, the legend, the most recent Legend of Zelda games, uh, Breath of the Wild, and then now the newly announced Tears of the Kingdom. The aesthetics that the designers of the game are using are just very fascinating it has some indigenous elements some of it is has some ainu if you don't know about the ainu people they are the indigenous peoples of japan has some of that elements it looks like they are obviously inspired by kind of mesoamerican aztec and uh stuff as well but it's like futuristic but at the same time post-apocalyptic stuff like that you know like i feel like that the aesthetics and the themes are very strong points that can be drawn upon by future native 
and non-native filmmakers obviously and i i feel like the art show and then obviously the fashion show too the fashion was very interesting and this is one i think of like i think there were three fashion shows in total at the market and a lot of these artists are doing that as well uh, they're combining you know quote unquote contemporary trends with indigenous trends and in, in the fashion and i feel like you know this the whole thing we're moving into a a new wave and a new era of art for you know for native art and obviously we have all you know artists in the past to thank especially for those in the 70s and 80s you know people like rc gorman you know again i feel like just going to this and i felt it was important to kind of showcase this and rant a bit about it in conclusion, I, again, this was just a quick little thing. I was only able to capture a few things here and there as I was very limited on time. But regardless, I think it's important to understand that, again, I, I don't want to agree that we are in a renaissance because that means that we were never here, obviously, yes. But I feel like looking at it in regards to waves like the French New Wave, there's different cinematic and art cultures they get waves and i feel like this is a new wave of indigenous themed content and art so that's it for now um i i'm gonna finish up my dark winds review for you guys i am in the middle of watching Re reservation dog season two and i am loving it so far i just finished rutherford falls season two and i absolutely loved it which makes it being canceled hurt all the more. <laughs> um, and so I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Thank you.